Chapter 8. Flight and a Follower I told them nothing of Eloy's and what had changed my mind. This was not just because I was ashamed to admit that I had seriously thought of staying behind, of allowed myself to be capped for the sake of the rewards that would follow, though I was bitterly ashamed. It was also because I did not want to talk about Eloy's to anyone. Subsequently, Henry made one or two sly remarks which obviously referred to her, but I ignored them. At this time, though, he was still too shaken by my appearance to say much. It sounded sensible and well-planned, the way I told him, that I had thought it was best to give them 24 hours start, and then steal a horse and follow them. This gave us all the greatest chance of getting away. I did not tell them of my experience with the tripod. I thought they might be able to cast some light on it, that Beanpo, at least, would be able to work out a theory to come for it, but they were as much at a loss as I was. Beanpo was anxious that I should try to remember if I had actually been taken inside the tripod and what it had been like, but of course I could not. It was Beanpo who said that Archicide must go. I had not thought about this, except in a hazy way of imagining that, if I found the other two again, I could generously let them have turns in riding him, myself remaining his proprietor. But it was true, as Beanpo pointed out, that three boys on a horse, unlike three boys on foot or a single boy on a horse, presented a picture that posed questions in the mind of any who saw them. Reluctantly, I accepted the fact that I could not keep him. We took off his saddle, because it had the arms of the two rouge stamped on it, and hid it behind the ridge of a rock, kicking dirt and piling stones over it, conceal it to some extent. It would be found eventually, but not as soon as Archicide was likely to be. He was a fine horse, and whoever came across him, running free and without harness, might not search too far for an owner. I freed him from his bridle, and he tossed his head at liberty. Then I owner. I freed him. Then I gave him a sharp slap on the hump. He reared, went a few yards, and halted, looking back at me. I thought he was unwilling to leave me. And tried to think of some excuse for keeping him a while longer. But he waned, tossed his head again, and trotted away to the north. I turned my head, not wanting to see him go. So we set off, once more on our way, the three of us once more together. I was very glad of their company, and held my tongue even when Henry, by now recovered, made a few slighting remarks about how hard this must be after the life of luxury, which I had enjoyed at the castle. In fact, being called inventors, stopping him, Beanpo, it seemed to me, was taking it for granted that, in so far as there was a leader in our little group, it was he. I did not like feel like challenging that, either, at least not at the moment. I did find the walking tiring. The muscles one used were quite different from those used in riding, and there was no doubt that I was out of condition, as a result of my illness and the protracted indolent convalescence that had followed it. I gritted my teeth, though, and kept up with the others trying not to show fatigue, but I was glad when Beepo called a halt for a meal and rest. That night, too, when we slept out under the stars, with the hard earth under me instead of the downfold mattress to which I had grown accustomed, I could not help feeling a little sorry for myself. But I was so tired, having had no sleep the night before, that I did not stay long awake. In the morning, though, every individual limb felt sore, as though someone had been kicking me all night long. The day was bright again, and still, without the breeze that had cooled us yesterday, this would be the fourth, the next to last day of the tournament. There would be the melee and riding at the ring, and Louise would still be wearing her crown, awarding prizes to the victors. And after tomorrow, we reached the pass marked on the map, not long after we set off. We followed the river, which came down out of the hills, its course interrupted at times by splashing falls some of them quite large. Higher up, the map showed the place where another river came close to this one, for a while running almost alongside it, and we came to it before evening. This second river, except in a few places where it had broken in banks, was oddly straight-sided and uniform in width. Moreover, it ran on different levels, the divisions between them marked by the faces plainly made by the ancients whilst rotting timbers and rusting iron wheels and such. Beanpole, of course, worked it all out to his satisfaction. Men had made the second river, digging out its bed and perhaps feeding water into it from the main river. He showed us that, beneath the grass and other vegetation covering the banks, there were bricks, carefully laid and mortared. As for the devices, 
there was a means of permitting boats to pass from one level of the river to another, a method of filling and draining the short stretch between the two sections, that were at different heights. The way he explained it made it sound reasonable, but he was good at making fantastic things seem pleasurable. He grew quite enthusiastic about the idea as we traveled alongside the river. This could be, had been, he was sure, an aquatic schmanze, with boats pulling carriages along the level waters and people getting on and off at the places where the wheels and things were. With your steam kettle pushing them, Henry said, why not? Plenty of water for it, anyway. I said, some of the socks seem to have been very close together and others miles apart. And there are no signs of villages having been there, only the ruins of a cottage. Sometimes not even that, he said impatiently. One cannot understand all the things that ancients did, but they built this river. It is certain, and must therefore have used it. It could be fixed to work again. Where the strange river turned sharply back on itself toward the north, we left it. The country that followed was much rougher, with even fewer signs of cultivation or human habitation. Food was beginning to be a problem again. We had got through that which we had brought from the castle, and the pickings here were small. At our hungriest, we came on wild chicken's nest. She had been sitting on a clutch of fourteen eggs, and ten of them we found we could manage to eat, with the aid of the sharp spice of hunger. The rest were bad. Why well, would have beaten her as willingly if we had been able to catch her? At last we looked down from the hills into a broad green valley through which a green river flowed. Far in the distance, other hills rose. Beyond them again, according to the map, were the mountains, which marked our journey's end. We had come a long way, and still had far to go, but the valley was patchworked with fields, and one saw houses and farms and villages. There was food down there. Foraging through proved less easy than we had expected. Our first three attempts at raiding were frustrated, twice by furiously barking dogs, the third time by the farmer himself, who woke and came after us, shouting as we scattered through his yard. We found potato fields and managed to stave off the worst of our hunger, but raw potato was a poor diet for traveling and living rough on. I thought unhappily of all the food that went to the wassail at the castle. This, I calculated, would have been capping day, when the feasting was on an even more magnificent scale than the during the tournament. But thinking of that, I thought of Eloy, who would not be at this feast, there were worse things than hunger, worse ills than physical discomforts. The next morning, our luck changed. We had come more than halfway across the valley, had swung the river and afterwards let the sun dry us as we lay exhausted on its banks, and were moving into higher country again. There was a village to which we gave a wide berth, but even from a distance we could see activity down there. Flags and banners were out for the local celebration. I thought of capping. But Bingo said it was more likely to be one of the many church feasts they had during the year. These were more common in his land than in England. We watched for a time, and while we were doing so, witnessed an exodus from farm, a farmhouse. A few hundred yards from the corpse where we had laid, two traps were brought down around the front door, the horses decoated with ribbons, and people piled into them, dressed in their Sunday clothes. They looked prosperous and well fed, I said hungrily. Do you think they've all gone? We waited until the traps were out of sight before we made our recording system. Beanpo approached the house while Henry and I waited nearby. If there was someone in, he would make an excuse and get away. If not, there was not even a dog. Perhaps they had taken it with them to the celebration, and we did not have to break in. A window had been left far enough open for me to wriggle through the slip, the doorboards for the others. We wasted no time, but headed for the larder. We polished off a half cart goose and some cold roast pork, and spread brawn on crusty bread. When we had eaten as much as we could, we filled our packs and went, replete and somewhat sluggishly, on our way. And guiltily? It was the biggest act of piracy, or theft if you like, which we had committed so far. The bells still rang out in the valley, and the procession was moving along the main streets of the village. Children in white followed by their elders, presumably including the farmer and his wife who would come back to find their larder stripped. I could imagine my mother's distress, my father's anger contempt at such pilfering. In Britain, no stranger was sent away hungry, but the rules of mine and thine were sacrosanct. The difference was that we were not strangers. We were outlaws. In our pitifully punny way, we were at war, essentially with the tripods, but indirectly with all those who, for whatever reason, supported them. 
including, I forced myself to stare in the face, those I had known and been found at the Chateau de la Deux Rouge. Every man's hand was against us in the enemy country through which we marched. We must live by our wits and resources. None of the old rules applied. Later, we saw a tripod coming along the valley, the first we had seen for some days. I thought Beanpo had been wrong, that it was heading for the village and a cabin, but instead of going there, it stopped, well clear of habitation, a mile or so from us. It stayed there, as motionless and seemingly inanimate as the one at the castle had been. We went on a little faster than before, and kept in cover as much as we could, though there seemed like good point in it. There was no reason to assume that it was concerned with us, or could even see us. It gave no indication of wanting to follow us. In an hour or so, we lost sight of it. We saw the tripod, or a similar one, the next morning, and once again it halted some way from us and stayed there. Again we moved on, and lost it. There was more cloud in the sky than there had been, and there were more blustery winds. We had finished the food we had taken from the farmhouse. Beepo had wanted to ration it out, but for once Henry and I had overridden him and did not find any more as the day wore on. We were hungry again, probably the more so because we had eaten well the day before. Toward evening, we climbed up through fields closely fed with plants, supported by sticks, on which were clusters of small green fruit. These would be picked when they were fully grown and ripe, and their juice squeezed out of them to make wine. There had been a few fields of them in the neighborhood of the castle, but I was amazed by how many of them there were here, and how the fields, or terraces, rather, were laid out to catch the rain and sun. I was hungry enough to try one of two or the large fruits, but they were hard and sour, and I had to spit them out. We had been sleeping in the open, but we realized that, with the possibility of the weather breaking, it might be a good idea to find some shelter for the night. In fact, we discovered a hut, a rough and ready affair set at the junction of three of the fields. Remembering our last experience, we were wary of going in, but Beanpo assured us that it was a place that would only be used at the time of picking the fruit, and certainly there was no dwelling in sight, only the long ranks of sticks and planks stretching away in the dusk. It was very bare, with not even a chair or table, but the roof, although it showed the sky in places, would keep most of the rain off us. It was a relief to have found refuge and shelter, and, poking around, we also discovered food, although it was barely edible. It consisted of strings of onions, such as the blue jerseyed men from across the sea sometimes brought to Wharton, but those were withered and dry, in some cases rotten. They might have brought here by the workers at the last picking, though it was hard to see why they would have been abandoned. At any rate, they stayed the protests of our bellies to some extent. We sat in the doorway of the hut, chewing on them, and watched the light fade behind the line of the hills. It was a peaceful end, even with a supper of stale and whittled onions, and the prospect of a night on a hard clay floor, I felt more contented than I had done since leaving the castle. The things that had disturbed me seemed to fade with distance. And we were doing well. In a few more days, we should be within reach of the mountain. Then Henry went around to the other side of the hut and, a moment later, called to us to come, too. He did not seem to draw our attention to it. The tripod stood anchored to the hillside, not much more than half a mile away, Henry said. Do you think it's the same one? I said. It wasn't in sight when we came up to the hut. I looked over that way, Henry said uneasily. Of course, they all look alike. We must go on, said Bipo. It may be accidental, but it is better to not to take chances. We abandoned the hut and toiled up on the hill. We lay in a ditch that night, and I did not sleep well, though fortunately the rain held off. But I doubt I should have slept at all in the hut, aware of the monster central outside. The tripod was not in sight when we set out in the morning, but not long after we stopped at midnight, it or another heaved across the brow of the hill behind us and halted at much the same distance. I felt my legs trembling. Bimpo said, we must lose it. Yes, Henry said, but how? Perhaps we help it, Bimpo said, by staying in the open. Ahead of us lay fields, some with vines, others with different crops. To the left, a little of our course, there were trees. The edge, it appeared, of a forest which seemed to extend over the folds of land beyond. We will see, Bimpo said, if we can watch us through leaves and branches. We found a field planted with turnips before we entered the forest, and filled our packs with these, realizing there might be a small chance of provender ahead. But it was an immense relief to be concealed. The green ceiling was thick over our heads. We saw only occasional fragments of the sky, 
the sun, not at all. Traveling was more difficult, of course, and more exhausting. In places, the trees were very thick, and there were others that, where the undergrowth was so tangled that we were obliged to find a way around rather than force a path through. At first, we half expected to hear the tripod crashing through the forest behind us, but as the hours went by with nothing but ordinary woodland noises, birds, the chatter of a squirrel, a distant grunting that was more slightly a wild pig, we grew confident that, whether or not we had been right in thinking we were being pursued, we had put the idea out of the question. We stayed in the forest that night, ending our day a little early on the lucky chance of coming across a woodman's hut. There was kindling, and I made a fire, while Henry took a couple of wild snares that were hanging on the wall, and slid them at the entrances to some rabbit holes nearby. We caught one when it came out from its night run, and we skinned it and roasted it over the burning log. We ate the rabbit by itself. There were still some tannins left, but by this time we were heartily sick of them. The next morning we headed for open country again, and reached it in good little over an hour. There was no sign of a tripod, and we set off in good spirits, over land which was more wild and cultivated, having a few meadows grazing cows and goats and occasional patches of potatoes and the like, but mostly moorland, scrub grass and bushes, including one that bore great quantities of a blueberry with sweet and delicate taste. We gorged ourselves on these and filled our packs with little potatoes. Steadily, the ran loads, and equally steadily grew bare. The forest had fallen away to the east, but there were clumps of pine which thickened to form a wood. We walked through its soft silence, where even bird song was hushed and far away, and came toward evening to the crest of a ridge, below which, for a hundred yards or more, the pines had been felled. Not long since, the axe scared stumps to clean Dwight and many of the trees were still lying where they had fallen, waiting to be dragged away. It was a vantage point. We could see down the slope of land, over the dark green tops of the standing trees, to other higher hills and beyond them, so remote, so tiny seeming, and yet majestic. The tops white, flushed with pink by the setting sun, pressed against the deep blue of the sky. I marveled to think that that was snow. At last, we were inside of the white mountains. Henry said, sounding days. They must be miles high. I suppose so. I felt better, looking at them. In themselves, they seemed to challenge the metal monsters who strode, unchecked and unopinioned. Over the lower lands, I could believe now, fully believe, that men might shelter beneath them and remain free. I was thinking about this when Bimpo moved suddenly beside me. Listen! I heard it and turned. It was behind us, a long way off, but I knew of the dust the crash and splinter of wood under the massive impact of the metal, the great feet stamping their way up through the pine wood. Then they stopped. We could glimpse it through a small gap in the trees, edged against the sky. Bimpo said, We have not been inside all the afternoon. We are now not inside now, and yet it knows where you are here. I said with a sick heart, It could be coincidence. Twice, yes. A third time, even. But not when the same thing happens again and again. It is following us, and it does not need to see us, as a dog will follow a scent. Henry said, that's impossible. Where nothing else explains, the possible impossible is true. But why fall? Why not come and pick us up? How can one tell what is in their minds? Bimpo asked. It may even be that it is interested in what we do, where we go. All the elation of a minute earlier had faded. The white mountains existed. They might provide us with refugee, but they were still a journey of many days away. The tribe had no more than a few giant strides. Henry asked, what are we going to do? We must think, Bimpo said. So far it is content with following us. That gives us time, but perhaps not much time. We set off down the slope. The tribe did not move from its position, but we were no longer under any illusion about that. We slogged on in a dispirited silence. I tried to think of some way of shaking it off. But the harder I concentrated, the more hopeless it seemed. I hoped the other two were having better success. Surely Bimpo could think of something, but he had not thought of anything by the time we stopped for the night. We slept beneath the pines. It stayed dry and, even at this height, was fairly warm, and the beds of needles, inches thick, it seemed, from the long years of the shedding, was softer than anything I had slept on since the castle. But there was not much consolation in that.